Hello, and welcome to episode 63 of the PowerScore LSAT podcast. This is John Dinning, as usual, in Los Angeles. And this is Dave Kalorn coming to you from Armageddon. <laughs> I was going to say, less usual for you. <laughs> Whatever this is that I'm living in, it is some degree of apocalyptic endings. Ah, that's so mysterious sounding. Explain. I know, but... I'm okay. Look, I'm still in Napa, just like always, because you know there's a quarantine going on, so I'm not going anywhere. But whatever is happening around me is extremely strange. <laughs> on uh, I think it was Thursday or Friday, it was 108 degrees, mm -hmm. and on Saturday it was 106, which is extremely unusual just in and of itself to see that type of heat. But it does get hot here, so yeah. I've seen like 102, 103 before. But then on both uh, Sunday and then t this is Monday night. So on Monday morning this morning, something happened that I've never seen happen here in all my years of living. And that was we had two major thunderstorms roll through that were electrical, mm -hmm. meaning the it, classic southern thunderstorm for you <laughs> with lots of rain and lightning strikes all over. And of course, what that then did was it uh, created a bunch of fires around me. Yeah. So now there's a fairly big fire right on the edge of uh, the town that I live in. I don't think it's a threat um, so much just because of the direction of the winds and where it is. And then it knocked the power out today as well. Yeah, for anyone listening who's never been in an electrical storm, they are horrifying. They are truly apocalyptic. It was crazy. Uh, well, because you can, you can really feel early. it. Like every hair on your body starts to constrict and stand up. I got caught in a golf course in Augusta one time when I was 14 or 15, probably the last time I prayed. Uh, and it, was, it was tremendous. It was just, you could feel the vibration in the air. And it feel was, the energy. Uh, yeah. Oh. It was quite a light show, but the one yesterday was uh, more on the Sonoma side, so over the mountains. So mm -hmm. I was like, they're getting hit hard, and they ended up with some fires over there that they were able to get under control. So you got more fireworks but, than firepower. Yeah, well, the lightning strikes in this kind of like dry climate. And the reason I say this is very apocalyptic and, and you know, Armageddon like is because normally in this part of California, once you hit June, it will not rain again until, you know, maybe September or usually October. And I, I don't mean like it hardly rains, I mean no rain at all. Oh, yeah. That's why there's such arid. a wildfire threat up here is there is zero rain and it just dries out and then the heat comes in and it's like an incinerator and any little spark, I get a little wind and you have a big problem. So to have two major thunderstorms roll through on this and to really do it to the entire Bay Area, yeah, I mean, it just feels like I'm living in an alternate reality, <laughs> which it already felt that way. Yeah, so I, I wonder which dimension I'm in at this point. <laughs> what's going on? As opposed to <laughs> the normal world that you live in. Uh, well... I'm glad you're okay. It does explain. I already know the drink you're drinking, but it does explain it. Yes, because earlier today at about, I don't know, 11 a.m., it was so dark outside that I was I, I was like, it's almost like there's uh, an eclipse going on. So in honor of the dark and stormy nature of what had happened today, that's the drink I've chosen. Dark and stormy. Yeah, you texted me at like noon today. And you're like, dude, I need a flashlight right now. <laughs> I couldn't get my so head around weird. it. There you go. It's been an odd California a couple of days because this heat uh, pattern that's going through produced a 130 degree temperature in Death Valley, yeah. which in modern times is the highest recorded temperature on Earth. So if you're thinking that things are like, oh, it's all normal. No, it's pretty hot out there. <laughs> 108's rough, but 130, mm-mm. Never been a better time to stay indoors and study for the LSAT. <laughs> That's how we can play I can this. Do. I don't. I mean, we're <laughs> well, all if looking I'm drinking for a, a dark and spin. stormy. Uh, here's my positive spin. I knew you were yeah. drinking something somewhat cataclysmic, dark and, <laughs> and I tried to go the opposite direction. I'm drinking a good old sea breeze, Aww. which is I didn't have most of the ingredients, but I did have vodka, <laughs> and I <laughs> it's just a straight vodka yeah. shot. And I had a, no, I had a little bit of cranberry. So I'm, it's a pink vodka. But let's be honest, I'm actually, it's just vodka. I'm a big fan of the Sea Breeze drink that I like quite a bit. It's got a nice, refreshing acidity to it, but it's still light. There you go. So if you've had a lot of drinks and you're like, man, I need to like freshen up, that's the perfect drink for you. 
or anyone. Tell me, tell me, Dave, what it does to you as a lead-in for stronger drinks, because I think that's how my night's about to be. Uh, also, very good. It's okay, kind great. of like an aperitif in it's that a good, respect. Yeah, it's a good base. Yeah, wonderful. It's, it's a palate cleanser. It prepares you for the rest of the night. So it, this drink is good at any time of Thank the evening. Thank you. That, that makes me feel a little better about my choices to come. It was dinner or sea breezes. <laughs> I'm you didn't a, think I would be waxing eloquent the on, the vi- <laughs> <laughs> on the viability of a sea breeze, no matter what time of no, night No, I knew it was. what you were going to say. That's why I asked. Uh, <laughs> I also am going to defer to you and your wisdom for the song. Well, I had to go back to the 80s again, just because things are so weird. And, you know, that's not just the quarantine virus situation. But or just a temperature life. you'd prefer. Yeah, <laughs> just the strangeness of what's been happening around here the last couple of days. And, and who knows if the power goes out again or if the smoke or the fire comes this way, I'm out of here. Yeah. But it is a song, it's a classic song from a band that really was a two-hit wonder. Maybe three, but two in my opinion. The band's name is Golden Earring, and the song is Twilight Zone. And I don't know what it is about this band, but they produce two fabulous songs that are both really long. The other one's Radar Love. But this song is like seven and a half minutes long. It's a really cool story that they tell. And I felt like I was listening to it actually earlier today when I was trying to clean up some of the, the branches that had been blown down from this storm. <laughs> and I was like, this might be really good for the podcast tonight. So there Twi- it is. Twilight Zone. Uh, yeah, you, you sent me a link to the video for this song. And early on in it, I was hooked because this guy in a hotel room with really high-waisted like 1940s gangster style suit pants up to his navel tucking a dead body into a suitcase and i was like you you know my market is, is that the life you want to lead is yeah. that what you're telling me yeah <laughs> oh, watch out yeah i want to rob banks you. back in the day before they knew what dna was that's when I wanted. bonnie and clyde era kind of stuff exactly. is that what you're saying yes yes uh, well I let's just talk like about uh Let's talk about the current world, not the <sighs> 1930s world that you hearken back for. Fair enough. <laughs> it's been a lot of action since we last talked about various things here. Let's start off with kind of like closing out a discussion that we talked about in our last episode, which was about the lost LSATs. Yeah, I want to put a button on this too, because I know for a lot of people, this was terrifying, uh, either personally or progressively, like predictively. Yeah, and I was able to talk to them several times after the episode that we recorded, even after all the scores had finally been released, and kind of go through this with them. And I feel like I have a really good understanding of kind of like what happened, why it happened, and the steps that they have taken to forestall anything like that ever happening again. Okay. And I can't really go into uh, tremendous detail about it, unfortunately. But we did, as it turned out, they originally had something like 120, 130 scores lost. I think they ended up recovering a total of 80 of them. Mm -hmm. And so they ended up really doing a pretty good job in terms of the recovery. Obviously, for the 40 or so people that didn't have their scores returned, it's still a complete catastrophe. So this is in no way downplaying that or mitigating that. Um, It's more just a matter of, okay, now that it's happened the appropriate thing to do is to analyze the aftermath and figure out, could it happen again? Right. In talking to them, you know, technology is always a little bit uncertain, but they've put steps into place so that there won't be the likelihood of this occurring again. And I would be very surprised if it did happen again. Um, You and I talked about the fact that they were clearly aware of how bad this was, not just, you know, from the optics of it, which are horrendous, but also just from the actual real world impact. The yeah. students that lost their um, their scores had to retake the exam or postpone it. Cost them a lot of time. So I know now why it happened, and my understanding of it is at least that one of the things that we saw, which was the mistakenly reported score of one thirty five, which then got changed to like a one seventy five. That's precisely that, the numbers, by the way. Yeah, that will not happen again. I think that was a product <laughs> of a rush to judgment and a honest desire to get scores out as quickly as possible without an appropriate double check. That double check is now in place, and I feel pretty comfortable that that type of mistake won't happen again. I've had some people who have said, you know, is it possible that I would have had a really low score and they would have then reported a really high score accidentally for me? Based on what I know of the process, that's extremely unlikely. So it only goes one way. They could take a high score and destroy it, but 
this <laughs> situation they had before is very, very unlikely to take a low score and somehow elevate it accidentally. Yeah, if I had to put my signature to anything, it would be the legitimacy of the results. I think that's fair to say. I think it's the whole, you know... We, I yeah, I, I don't think we're them. seeing scores get artificially reported up or down. No, I think they want to report the scores as they as they were, and they talked a lot about that. The, they were like, the integrity of this requires us to report the scores that... You know, we're able to verify. We're able to verify these. We're going to report them no matter what. And so I thought that was at least an honest answer in the face of what was clearly a, a, a real problem for them. Yeah. Honest in the sense of I actually believe it. Yeah. <laughs> Which is telling always, us what's going on. Case, so. Yeah. In this, in this particular instance, I think they made a mistake. They admitted it. They explained why. And I don't foresee that being an issue. You know, this, I hope to close the book on this. And obviously, you and I never want to talk about this again. I don't ever want to hear about mm-hmm. lost scores again. One of the things that we didn't really go into detail last time, though, is that this may have happened on a digital exam. And that has its points of concern that we've already talked about. But the truth is, this happened with, you know, in person tests as well. Mm-hmm. It was never something where it was. Everybody got their score. There were examples of test centers losing the package that had the tests in them and scores, you know, being lost. This had happened over the years. This is something that is, you know, there's humans involved. And sometimes I think it's easy to forget that, that humans will make mistakes. Now we've got a little bit less of a problem because I think they've put multiple humans in line to double check the human before them. So I think we'll be in better shape. But I hope this never happens again for the sake of the students taking the test and yeah. just for the peace of mind of it. Neither of us gain any pleasure of talking about the possibility that scores are misreported. So uh-uh. I'm with you. I'm a lot with of pain from it. Um, they seem to have self-corrected best they could. Yeah, it's not pleasurable. It's painful in the extreme. So mm, Yeah, and no, that's kind of like wincing even now, <laughs> reflecting back on it. So this is interesting, though, because they did then in the – kind of like the ensuing time, they came out with an announcement, another change to test policy. And of course, we've already seen this. We've talked about test policy changes over the last couple of weeks. And for example, that score preview. Mm -hmm. John, what are the test changes that they came out with this time? (laughs) Thanks for the lob. Uh, (laughs) That's really quite the alley-oop. There were two that I think students are going to be really grateful for, both minor, but at least somewhat significant in the sense of what they represent. The first, you can use mechanical pencils now. So if that's what you're looking around your house or apartment or whatever using, you can use mechanical pencils. I think the slightly more significant one is that you can now use earplugs. Not your buds, nothing mechanical, but you can use earplugs as you take the test. Yeah, so I think that's covered. great, by the way. That was clearly my favorite of the two. I think both of them work. The the mechanical pencil one also includes pens, and that means you can use a regular pencil, a mechanical pencil, or a pen. Yeah. Uh, so you can pretty much use what you want. Feather, I, quill, whatever. Like, it's pretty much all allowed at this point. Be awesome, man. Yeah, that would, I would <laughs> love to see that. Somebody, like, truly Ben Franklin this thing. What are you doing there, sir? Uh, <laughs> I'm mean? using a quill, and this is my ink pot. That's right. <laughs> Uh, that's going to cause someone to get in trouble, I imagine. Someone's going to do it. Don't do it. If you heard it it. please. I was just riffing. Let us do it the next time we take the test. But you can use any of those. I'm not a big fan of using pens just because I don't like the permanency of them on the scratch paper in case you make an error. Uh, But I love the mechanical pencil. I'm a big fan of those. And I think that would be fabulous to have uh, as kind of like a writing instrument during the exam. Yeah. I like the confidence implied. By an ink pen. Yeah, and sometimes people <laughs> but, will write out certain things and they want permanent and then and right. so forth. So I understand the utility of it. I'm just saying it's great for them if they want to use it. If you're out there thinking, Dave, I like pens, what's your problem with them? It's just not for me. I feel you. That's that's the same thing. It's just you do it, you're cool, I don't mind it, just not something I'm gonna do. Fair enough, yeah. I'm out plucking ducks. So <laughs> 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 good sir. Yeah, good sir. <laughs> May I borrow your? I shall be your, using my yeah. quill today. That's right. Uh, uh, talk about earplugs, the, though, because number one, why was this prohibited for so long? And number two, why would someone be grateful that it no longer is? I think they were concerned about a couple different things. One being, can you hear the proctor? 
mm. who might say to you, like, I, you know, might just start talking to you and you're not hearing him. Look, there's no earplug that's quite that good. You're going to hear somebody <laughs> talking to you. Uh, and then they were also concerned about the possibility of using earplugs as cheating devices. Yeah. Where you'd have somebody talking in your ear. And you and I have, have kind of covered this previously, and the idea of cheating on this version of the exam to me is just so ludicrous. I'm like, yeah, sure. It's just, even if they can talk to you in, their, in your ear, what are they saying? Right. They can't see the questions. So they're basically annoying you during the test. <laughs> it uh, just be you or me in their ear giving them like positive reinforcement. You've you got to do it. You Get can to do number it. Seven. You're on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> would be useless. useless. It would, in fact, would be detrimental. And that's kind of like, at this point, the way the test is structured, I think cheating would be a detrimental exercise. You'd cost yourself more time and harm than you would gain from it. I completely agree with that, by the way. The attempt would cost you more than it could ever gain. Yeah. As I've always said to people who propose cheating schemes, I'm like, if you put this kind of effort into studying, you wouldn't need to cheat. Yeah, just learn it so, at this point. Yeah. I had friends like that spend... in college where I was like, just study. What do you, this is so elaborate. No, I'm going <laughs> to spend study. eight hours with this little cheat sheet. I'm like, come on, bro. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, <laughs> when I talked to LSAC about this, they made a very kind of like pointed comment to the effect of make sure that people understand that this is those little soft, squishy earplugs. And you're going to have to show them to the proctor. This is not an earbud. You can't put your iPhone, you know, AirPod in there and have it work. Those will get rejected. So anything electronic, anything that looks suspicious to them, they're going to knock back on. Like I have some pretty um, decent kind of like earplugs for like concerts where they still let in mm -hmm. like the uh, the sonic spectrum in a balanced way. And that's not going to probably fly because they look a little bit technical. Anybody looking at it would be like, there's some issue with that. It looks right. like it has a little antenna on it. They're going to reject those. But a regular squishy one, you're good to go. Which invites now, of course, the whole conversation of, well, all right, mine look like this, and I'm using packing peanuts, and someone else is like, well, mine have a little wire that hangs off, but it's only to keep them in place. It's like, Ugh. but in theory, as long as it's not electronic, you're allowed to use it. Yeah. It's harder to prove. Like those ones that you see, like the, uh, the, the ground workers at airports. Yeah. Where they, they're kind of like on the, the little lace... And it's around their neck. I think if you showed that, they'd be like, okay, I yeah. understand what that Anything is. Anything over the ear? No. Yeah. So what to me this represented, though, and, and what I was most encouraged by, is that not only is LSAC listening to the things that people are asking for, but they're innovating. And I love that. I love that this test, as much as it annoys both of us, to have to continue to talk about this stuff. I love that this test continues to evolve in what is, in my opinion, the right direction. Yeah, they're learning. Yeah. Yeah. So they seem to be taking steps to improve the user experience. And I'll never, ever argue with that. Um, I mentioned in one of our latest episodes, Dave, how they can essentially preempt the, uh, the complaint about test security or test accuracy that they could just take a screenshot of the navigation bar at the end if they were to show the answer choices. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. One of the things you and I were both exploring last week was that our system can now allow for handwriting onto the test. Yeah. But we we're not going to do that. It. We're not going to enact that until the system itself does. We don't want to misrepresent what your experience will be. But the fact that we can do it means that they can do it. Yeah. And the point that you're talking about is specifically in our test scoring system where we present like questions digitally, which is what we use for our analytics and testing package. It's what we use in our courses and so forth. Uh, our tech guys, he was hilarious. He's like, guys, would this be useful? And I was like, on the real test, yeah. Both of us were like, yeah, hell yeah. I was like, we love <laughs> this. He goes, yeah, don't green light it. I was like, it. but don't, don't do implement it. it because then you give a false impression of what is capable on the day of the test, which is really, it's, you know, it's not that cool for us. We're like, well, we could do this and we think it would help students, but at the same time, it trains people to notate and mark in a way that is actually not beneficial when the real test shows up. It's misrepresentative. And yeah. So we, we told them, we're like, all right, guys, <laughs> go ahead and put this on ice, but, but don't throw it away. Yeah, you know, save your code. code. 
<laughs> yeah, and that was the response we got. All right, the code's been vaulted. If right. we ever need it, we know how to do it. I'm like, that's really cool. But they were showing examples of they were just writing across the question in freehand, and it didn't conform to, you know, the little blocks of text or anything. It was just like writing on the screen. Sure. And I was like, that is, that's awesome. But again, as you said, if we can do it, you know that they have the capacity to do it. So we may see that at some point. It's not a promise. It's not even any kind of insight. It's nothing I've ever talked to them about. Uh, I don't know what their development curve is, but I know that if we are able to do it, for sure, they'd be able to put the resources towards figuring it out. It's an opportunity that I hope they grasp and that I hope they embrace. Me as well. So since we last spoke, uh, they opened the door rather quickly. It was about a 24-hour notice to sign up for the August test and choose your test dates and times. Yeah, you made it plural just now, and that always stings. <laughs> well, that's because it goes over. How, how many days is the August test over? Is it two I, years? I think it's the way it feels like it. <laughs> By the end of the day one, it feels like two years. Uh, I think day it's one four is days the equivalent right of dog done. years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I know it, it begins on the 29th, but I think it runs through the first or second. It's a lot. No, it's longer than that. It's like a week, man. Uh, well, yeah, with accommodated people and other things. Um, the main test days seem to be like Saturday, Sunday, Monday, but it's going to be, it's going to be a big one. Yeah, they will also have um, gaps in that testing as they did before, just literally to give Proctor U a break and a breather. Not for so us. They don't have you don't to think be. they're doing it for us? I would like to think that they're doing it for us, but I don't believe that that is what is actually yeah, happening. Correct. Interestingly enough, though, I was talking uh, to one of my contacts there, and uh, they mentioned that the sign-up time opened at noon Eastern. Mm -hmm. By 2.30 Eastern, they had over 18,000 test takers who had scheduled their times. And the reason I mention that is, A, because there's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. But imagine what happened at noon, because we saw a few people writing, like, I can't get into the system or it's slow. Well, yeah, there was like 18,000 people trying to get a time at that point. Right. And so it overloads the system. And if, if you're looking at it, they have hundreds of slots every hour. So it's not like there's two slots at 7.20 a.m. There's many more than that available throughout each hour of testing. And when you go, with, if you sign up right when it opens up, you're going to probably run into some delays just because it's, it's the classic F5 situation. Their <laughs> server is overloaded. They can't keep up. You're having to refresh or try to get it to load. It will load eventually. But keep that in mind when we get to the discussion of October yeah. uh, in a few minutes because I have a feeling we're going to see this again. Yeah, people panic a little bit that their desired slot, desired day is going to fill up. It's not filling up. It's just slow to load. You have to be patient yeah. with it. Most of the time, I see people get times that are either right on the nose of what they wanted or really close to it. Yeah. Remember, these are in 20-minute increments, too. So, yeah. I mean, the worst case I've seen is somebody being bumped 40 minutes or something. It's, you're, you're okay. It's like a it's exactly right. Taylor Swift album release. The music's still there. You just might have to wait for it to download. You know, these days, it's more like a cosmetic release. Fair enough. I don't, is that a Kylie Jenner reference? You're the one with the daughter. I don't know. Uh, no, it goes it goes uh, well beyond Kylie Jenner to a whole host of like cosmetics influencers who these days when they put out like their newest kit and their color palette, dude. If I don't know if you've seen the sales of it, but it is jaw dropping. Like <laughs> half a million sales in the span of an hour, just crashing systems. I'm like, man, I didn't know cosmetics was quite that big of a deal, but maybe I should have thought more I about say, it. Yeah, Power Squares next episode brought to you by. <laughs> <laughs> Is it Charles. sad or relieving that I don't actually have a name to put on that? Jeffree Star is sponsoring us. I don't know what that is. Uh, you don't know any of that. No, no I was just but. happy to hear about Golden Earring. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know what in the world you're talking about. You need to get into the culture, man. Let's get current, get past. These things are all connected. <laughs> What was I? I was listening to uh, Adam and the Ants, an album from the early 80s, Kings of the Wild Frontier, mm -mm. and an album that I love. But I was looking at their style, and I was remembering when I was younger, I was like, those guys dress so cool. <laughs> it's, it all comes back. That kind of fashion is back these days. It is so. cyclical. This is true. Very much so. Well, there we go. Anyway. Uh, speaking of this hamster wheel, <laughs> what else has been going on in the LSAT world? Um, this is an update. 
I'm kind of happy about. LSEC's website has moved forward. It's been improved. Yeah. Just uh, saw it out of the blue, loaded it in. I was like, this is different. Yeah. You said improved. Would you call it improved? Changed? Yes. Different? I would call it I improved. think it's slightly better done. I used to have a lot of problems with the hover overs, mm. trying to get to like the LSAT dates and stuff, and it just wouldn't work. And where it would, I'd click on it, and it would click something else. It looks like they fixed that by and large. I think so, so too. So I was pretty stoked about that. And it's just a little bit cleaner and, and bigger from a visual standpoint. I like it. And you and I had actually spoken to them years ago when they were doing the iteration previous to this. This is not a huge step forward in terms of like difference of presentation. It's still very much the same layout and so forth. It's just cleaner, bigger, bolder. It's a little more modernized. I think yeah, we kind of consulted nice on some of their earlier website updates, in fact. which Made was, suggestions about yeah. what people were looking for and, and things like LSAT dates had to be front and center so that people could get to them quickly. I hesitate they, to had, say that because anyone who hates their website immediately turns to us. And that's not the <laughs> website we would have designed. Time. Right. <laughs> It's, it's getting fault. closer. This is better. <laughs> I also noticed that they have added a bunch of uh, digital law school forms. Yeah, I like that a lot. Yeah, this, this replaces what they typically do during the summer, which is they have in-person forms in places like D.C. or Houston or Los Angeles or New York, where you can go and actually go into a big conference center and meet the representatives from various law schools. You can sit in some panels that they have where they talk yeah. about various things. Something we always advocate, by the way. Anytime yeah. you can get face to face with people at a school you might want to attend, do it. Take the interview, Learn more. take the consultation. Yeah. Yeah, and they're handing out all sorts of stuff and swag, and there's bags and there's brochures. <laughs> you walk it's over an interesting the thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, they can't do that this year for right. obvious reasons. Yes. So they're doing it digitally, and they've got them coming up at the end of September, the middle of October, the middle of November, and the middle of December. So you can definitely check those out. Uh, they say they're going to try to do the same type of thing where there's almost like a hall where you can talk to various representatives and get like, you know, a quick chat with them. You never know what will happen with that. Maybe lightning will strike, as it has in Napa many times already today. <laughs> you, you of all people could testify. Uh, well, I know on the news <laughs> earlier tonight, they were talking about all the lightning strikes and all the fires. Uh, sometimes there's a good lightning strike when right. you meet a law school rep and you actually genuinely connect with them. So Yeah, there you go. That's a fine That's analogy. Good. I think this could clear some of your law school brush. Good for you. <laughs> we don't have any wildfires, nope. man. All right. Easy to joke about where I'm sitting right now when there's one, like, I don't know. No, easy to joke away. about where I'm sitting, where you're sitting right now. You should be packing a car. No, not yet. Uh, I'm comfortable. I worry about you, bud. I'm I worry right, about your yeah. kid. I don't really worry about you. That's fine, too. Yeah. I just, am I going to have to adopt her? Is that what this is going to turn into? Absolutely not. Okay, good. Don't even put me on the list. <laughs> you are not on the list. Perfect. I want you to know 100% that you were never considered well, for I the list. I want you to know 100% that hurts my feelings. <laughs> 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 but thanks. But uh, also thanks. Uh, no, that, that, that's a bad, that's a conversation that I have had with my wife, unfortunately. About me? Unfortunately. Not about you, oh. about like which of our relatives and so okay. forth. I was going to say, you That's both a tough have conversation. relatives for me not to enter the conversation. No, you weren't on the list. Sorry. <laughs> You're not sorry. I'm not either. I would probably, I would go with your sister before you, to be honest with you. So would I. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. No uh, knock on you. She'd do a great job. Mm -hmm. I'd be there for, you know, holidays. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. Yeah. Speaking of, I know, right? Absentee stepdad. Speaking of holidays, let's talk about August and the next LSAT. You like that pivot? You like that transition? If you consider it wasn't those my best. LSAT dates to be kind of like the, uh, you know, our LSAT holiday. Yeah. A work holiday. A, work, a working holiday. So uh, that test is coming up on, what, August 29th? This is when it when starts. It starts. Yeah. And then it spans. And of course, we know that it's flex. We know the score preview thing. We've covered all of this. Exactly. Now, kind of like, in connection with that, one of the things we have is the LSAT afterward, which is October 3rd. The registration deadline for that exam is Friday, August 21st. Mm -hmm. They have not flexed it officially. I did write them earlier today and say, hey, guys, are you going to flex it? And <laughs> didn't get a response. 
And I actually said, look, don't even tell me if you're going to. You don't have to tell me the exact date. Just tell me if you think you're going to before the registration. Mm -hmm. So usually when there's complete silence like that from people I consider to be highly reliable communicators, uh, it means that a decision is probably coming up. I, John, will they flex for the October LSAT? I mean, That's the first question. Yes. Come on, man. Yes. It's an obvious 100% choice. Why, why delay? Go ahead and say it right now. They're and it'll happen it. if I'm going to be even remotely controversial. It'll happen this week. I think it'll happen before the deadline, which is this Friday. Agreed on both accounts. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if it happened tomorrow, which is when this podcast will come out or the day after. Right. That gives people a couple of days to think about, do I want to sign up for a test that I know to be a flex exam? And if you're sitting there thinking, well, they don't need to decide yet, you know, October 3rd isn't that, you know, it's, it's still a ways away. No, it's not. It's actually really close still. And what was the article I mentioned to you prior to starting this broadcast? Which was the was, one about UNC? Yeah, Carolina. Uh, and this is not happy news. Your favorite Usually, school. I like, th I like throwing darts at Carolina <laughs> just because, you know, Duke. Um, this is not great. They started off in-person classes, I think, for their undergrad. Yeah. And at this point, they have 177 cases that have been confirmed among their students. So they've shut it down. And the law school at Carolina made an immediate pivot and said, uh, well, we thought we were going to have classes on campus, and that's not happening. Yeah. They tried to open. They failed spectacularly. Um, and they've, yeah, reversed course and, correctly, and but belatedly. Ones. Like, how, you had to see this coming. What are you doing, guys? Yeah. I, that's always what amazes me. I'm like, wasn't this obviously going to occur? Yeah, even Duke could see this coming. It's ridiculous. <laughs> No. no, even Georgia Sorry, Tech I just could to take see a cheap this coming. Shot. <laughs> you try and cheap shot me, I'll throw it right back at you. Jeez. Fair enough. Uh, <laughs> will Will October flex? I think so. Yes. yes. Will November? I I want to say no, but I I can't. It's gonna flex too. I think so too. We've been saying for weeks that October would flex. I've been asked about November. As soon as I said, I think October will flex, someone said, what about November? <laughs> and I was like, man, give me a minute. Yeah. Uh, but no, indeed, flying. I think they'll both flex. And come on, you can't even have a lot of uh, students on campus in college. You're going to go ahead and get a couple hundred of them together. We've seen what's happening with the bar exam, and it's a disaster mm -hmm. of trying to put people together. It's not going to work for the LSAT either. The LSAT is going to flex for the rest of the year. The real question should be, what's going to happen in January? Yeah, a very fair question. I don't want to try to call it because, I mean, good enough. You, you might not survive the week with electrical storms January. <laughs> what, is, what is this January? Uh, yeah, but the next couple of LSATs this year, I think for sure, are going to be taken at home on a computer. And that informs how you study. It also informs how we continue to try to offer assistance to people because it means, at least as far as I'm concerned, you could overrule me, but I don't think you would. We're going to continue to offer this at-home sale for people. If you want to get signed up for this test, we're giving discounts that are somewhat unprecedented. Take advantage. Take this test while you can, while you know what it's going to be. You know, you actually make a point I didn't think you were going to make. Oh. Somebody asked me about this last week. They're like, well, how long are you going to do this? And my immediate response was, I'm going to do it as long as I think it's necessary. Yeah. And as long as I still think there's problems and people are struggling and being affected by this, I'm going to keep it on. So yeah. as long as it feels appropriate. And it does. And it feels 100% appropriate, appropriate to me. And yeah. Yeah. We're going to continue on with this for sure. Yeah. Oh, look at you and your big old heart. <laughs> <laughs> My lightning struck hard. You're right. <laughs> Still won't trust me to raise your daughter. But you're no. giving a discount. All right. Okay. It's, you Fair. know, one of those is a lot easier I to know. do than the other. One of those, yeah, comes with far less consequences. <laughs> it, would you, if I said, John, seriously, I need you to like take the responsibility of a seven-year-old for the next minimum 11 years, and it's not like you can kind of like pop in and out. It's like you have to have constant monitoring and support and assistance. And my answer you really to you, you're ready for that? My answer to you is I have been looking for a good excuse for an au pair <laughs> for years now. And this is why you're not on the list. Right. Because I didn't want the au pair <laughs> to raise her. <laughs> What's wrong with the French maid? 
Uh, no. That's, <laughs> Keep her in the then, family then. Once Why? again, reconfirming that my process on this was 100% correct from the get-go. Uh, your decisions are correct, and I'm the first to sign right off on now. them. Yeah. <laughs> feel good that your name never came up. Not many names did come up, just to be honest. They so. sigh. Uh, <laughs> one of the things we're going to talk about is, um, coincidentally, what happens when things don't quite go your way. And maybe this is this is where you get in the meat of the discussion. Um, I'm not going to inherit your daughter. Other people mm-hmm. are occasionally going to run into a bad practice test. <laughs> Everyone needs to recover from these ever. moments. <laughs> what is happened that, there? Is that a good shift? That was pretty good. <laughs> that was a reach. No? Uh, yeah, fair enough. Uh, <laughs> what this episode truly revolves around. I'm just going to try to power through. I'm, I'm uh, just still laughing. Thanks. Is essentially a question you and I have both been asked a lot as the lead up to the August test um, continues to occur, which is I had a bad day or I had a bad weekend, a bad couple hours. What do I do to get my head back in the game or how do I process the fact that the most recent thing that I've done is something representative or reflective of what I would consider to be a worst case. What do I do? Yeah. And it was, it was the weekend that I just had Mm -hmm. that triggered this thought on my part. It's because this was really kind of a very sketchy weekend (laughs) in terms of all the things that happened. And for some reason, it reminded me this morning of the situation that you see so many times before the LSAT, usually a week or two out, somebody has a bad test day. Obviously, taking prep tests is something that you should be doing on the regular. And as it turns out, as we'll talk about, every once in a while, one of them doesn't go well. And so that's the connection here that we're actually talking about. And I think it's one of the most commonly posted questions that I see from students and certainly one of the most commonly sent messages that we receive Um, so much so that I'm really not able to answer all of the ones that come in. And I really wanted to talk about this. Somebody's going along, and let's just use like a prototypical student who's been scoring, you know, low 160s. They've gotten to that point. They used to be scoring, say, like 148, 150. They've moved up into the 160s. All of a sudden, they take a test, and for the first time in, I don't know, a month or two, they score like a 157 or a 158, and it shakes them. Yeah. It rattles them badly. It's that like earthquake do, regression where you didn't see it coming, but suddenly you're knocked down, uh, you know, a peg or three. What do you do to climb back up that ladder? And I think there's so much fear about how this works. And especially because people, their confidence gets vaporized mm-hmm. when this occurs. So let's talk about that for just a second and talk about the idea of should a kind of like a reversal of fortune here on your on your kind of prep test results that's kind of like an anomaly an outlier should it actually shake your confidence in your true ability is it i'm going to give it to you as a yes or no question i mean (laughs) rhetorically no of course not yeah and i'd have to agree with that the problem is is that mentally it's hard not to let it affect you yeah we have to put context around that no but well, I just wanted to start with the baseline. <laughs> the baseline is no. Uh, a, a single <laughs> event like that doesn't define you. It doesn't predict you. It's a single event. Treat it as the outlier that it presumably is. You also have to understand this in context of what the LSAT is. People get very focused on the idea that the LSAT is a single number, and that is a very definite thing. It is not definite. LSAC puts out guidance with each LSAT that says, oh, hey, um, you're really a score band. You're not really a 160. You're a 157 to a 163. Mm -hmm. The the reason they do that is because they know that you can't make fine line distinctions like 160 versus 161. Now, that's what they say. We know that law schools go out and do that every day. Of course. Ah, this, you know, this person's got one point higher. It's, it's, a, it's a big difference. And that's because the reality is, is the black and white three-digit number is hard to ignore. But the test makers themselves are saying that you're within a scoring band. The second thing is this, is if you've been practicing and you've had a couple of tests that are at a certain level, you're really establishing that as a general baseline. 
It's not an absolute floor. And that is something that a lot of people don't think about. They're like, well, I've been, I've gotten four scores recently and they're all 162 to 163. I'm like, okay, you probably are in that range. There's right. no guarantee the next one's going to be no lower than 162. Right. So there's like an inherent flexibility. You're not, it's like 5'8 to 6'2. How tall are you? That's different. As you would, I think, agree with because you're 6'2. Uh, <laughs> and, and you're not. Shut up. <laughs> But That's also, actually the first thing that people often say to me when they meet me. You're taller than I thought. You're surprisingly, <laughs> yeah, you're surprisingly tall. And then, you know, they're like, you're I more am, powerful than I believe. I am shockingly the height that most people would <laughs> suspect, right at six feet. Uh, you're not short, so. I'm not, well. Just for anybody who wants to know. Thanks, yeah. Six feet, but you you're tower over height. me in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> When it comes somebody to, once said, just not to, uh, to jump in, but somebody once said, oh, you know, if Dave and John got into a fight, I think I'd be taking John. And I was like, oh, I've got the reach advantage on him. Though. Yeah. You know, Tyler Durden says that tall guys fight till they're burger. And I love that <laughs> line from Fight Club. Skinny guys fight till they're burger. Who would you fight? My dad. Who would you fight? Lincoln. I love that. <laughs> uh, so there you go. I'm, no, Gandhi. I think Gandhi was the first answer. And then I fight Lincoln. Anyway, hmm. for anyone who hasn't read Fight Club, that makes no sense. For those of you who have, apologies. Yeah, for this quote. You're getting you're getting obscure in there. Although I'm getting yeah a little far afield. When it comes to this test, though, variance is totally normal. Not every test that you take is going to be 180. Most of them will. But you know, people have off days. That's how it goes. The El Sac Casino, as you have, I think, very shockingly appropriately put it. As well as the luck factors that come into play Precisely. that include that. So if you take that the test itself has already accepted that you're a score band, the idea of you moving around a few points, both up and down, right. isn't actually unnatural. And sometimes I see people who are like, I just got two points higher than my highest ever PT. And I'm like, that's fantastic. You know, let's hope that trend continues and you start to establish more of a baseline of being at a higher score. But there is natural movement that occurs inside these tests. The other thing is, and this is what you're referring to, the LSAT casino, is that I have talked repeatedly about the fact that some LSATs will be better for you than other LSATs. And I'll, I'll link the blog article because it's actually called Welcome to the LSAT Casino. Yeah. And I love the idea of an El Sac Casino. I really wish it existed. I should make a website called El Sac Spin Casino. Because <laughs> we often say that, we're like, well, if I had to make a bet in the El Sac Casino, I'd say that this test flexes. <laughs> um, but you go in and you might take a test that has a lot of conditional reasoning on it. Right. If you're good at conditional reasoning, this is right up your alley. But what if you're bad at it or it's not your strength? Well, you don't want to see that test. Well, maybe the next test has only 50% of the conditional reason that the last test did. That's obviously going to affect your score. The LSAT does not test the exact same set of concepts in the exact same degree every single time. Yeah. Because that moves around, it will affect your scores. So when you see that kind of like low score come in, that's okay. You don't need to think the, the, you know, the end of the world is here. Yeah. You, I think it it's Im not. important to make that distinction, too, is that the test tests the same things the same way, but it doesn't test them with the same frequency, one by yeah. one. And, I mean, you, you might get a passage in reading comp that you're familiar with or that you know something about. You might see a logic game that feels entirely unfamiliar to you. This well, is think just about part of, again, the luck of the draw. It totally is. Games is a great example of this. All right, there's some games or some game sections where there's just one grouping game mm -hmm. and there's others where there might be two or three. Yeah. So you look at that, it's like, well, if grouping is something you're really comfortable with, you want to see more of it. That's actually advantageous to you. And if you don't like grouping, you see that test, you're like, I'm hating my life. Yeah, there was a test last year that had three basic linear games on it. If you're an amazing game student, that's your worst nightmare because it's the thing you're best at essentially being watered down, being neutered. Not challenging you as yeah, much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That doesn't give you any opportunity to shine in the way that you potentially could. So, again, day to day, this is how the LSAT is. Yeah, and I think someone gets a low score or lower than what they had been expecting, and that confidence gets shaken. If you look at it in the context that we're talking about, it shouldn't shake your confidence. It should be like, well, that's not all that's 
you know, surprising. These things happen. I actually think it can be a really good thing. I wrote a different blog post called The Benefits of Failure. And we've talked about this where failure can be progress. As you look at things, when somebody has a really bad practice test in kind of like the week or two prior to the real exam, I always say the same thing to them. First, it didn't happen on the real thing. So that's great news. Yeah. It's also unlikely to happen again so soon after having this ha had happen because you're not going to be complacent. You're going to be really focused. It's kind of like if there's ever an airplane crash, flying in the couple weeks afterward is usually a good thing because everybody's <laughs> like on edge. They're looking carefully at all the planes. That's the analogy to use. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Twilight Zone, man. <laughs> Might as well just make this week worse. Truly, though, right? <laughs> Truly, though. Yeah, I mean, these things are called outliers by definition. They're unusual. Yeah, it's unlikely to happen again, but it's also they just handed you a great study tool mm -hmm. because it's motivating, number one. And then number two, what was it about this test that caused you problems? Where did you falter? And exploring that can be incredibly valuable yeah. and useful prior to the real LSAT. Because what if you all of a sudden discover, you know, I'm weaker on this than I thought. Well, now you've got time to go look at it. Yeah. So um, if there's one thing, sorry to interrupt you, but if there's one thing, I just want to really double down on what you just said. If there's anything that someone takes away from this and it's a single sentence, it's that the only way to avoid something going wrong is to have experienced it. Or at and least to know how to best recover from it. That's precisely it. The last thing you want on test day is something new. If you know well, what it takes to avoid a failure, you know it because you've failed. And that's yeah. okay. That's what this is. And when you look at this, it's you can take a look at it as glass half full or glass half empty. Like, oh my gosh, I did not do well. This is terrible. Or, all right, I didn't do well. That sucks but I will now use this to my advantage to learn and to remember what happened here. Yeah. Like I wish so this grapefruit kind of juice had more vodka in it. <laughs> Precisely your point. There you go. There you go. <laughs> so not a big surprise that this kind of thing would happen. It's actually designed in a way that it's expected to occur. You shouldn't be surprised by it. You shouldn't freak out about it. Yeah. Learn from it. Use that information to your advantage as you go forward and try to get better from it and realize it's less likely to happen the next time merely because it just did happen. Yeah. So I think that's pretty useful. And it's one of the, like I said, one of the most common questions that comes up. Um, well, the timeliness of it is, is sort of unimprovable when it comes to this because you and I are getting this daily, nonstop. Yeah. My score it's just dropped out no. And it's like, hang on. Let's actually figure out what this tells you and how to benefit from it because there's tremendous amounts of benefit that this can give you. So you keep on taking tests after that? Oh, yeah, I would. I do too. Yeah. By the way, this is also why I tell people don't take a test the day before the LSAT or even two days before the LSAT because if you do have this reversal of fortune, you don't have enough time to come back from it. <laughs> I had a tutoring student of mine email me this morning uh, saying that the most recent practice, the last practice test she took was a 179. And she took one this morning and emailed me about it, and it was 173. And she's like, what have I done? What's occurred? What happened? And I'm like, well, look, barring a head injury, this is a fluke. That this occurs. And I said, what was your mindset? And she's like, dude, I was super distracted. And she started rattling off all these things that were going through her head. And I was like, did you even need to ask? You, you seem like you know. Self-diagnosis yeah, is so hard, though. Yeah, I think though. you've got this one. And she wrote me back kind of with a joking tone, and she's like, yeah, you're right. And, and she's, also, she's a 179. She's that good. But let's be honest. At that level, very small variations in performance can have a really big impact on scores. Yeah, your 179, on 174 is a mistake per section, basically. Yeah, if so, if, if she was distracted, that's almost like tailor made to screw it up. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just say instead of it happening a week or two before the LSAT, what happens if it is the last test you plan to take, and all of a sudden things just go completely awry? Well, then we I hope that. number one, you've taken what we've just said to heart, <laughs> because there's probably not going to be a physical opportunity uh, to repair yourself, so it's going to have to be mental. But. Again, I, I just, I always look at these things as something to learn from. That's the way to always treat this feedback loop you find yourself in. 
What so does what this would tell you do me? Then? What do I do? I look at it and think, where was my head? Because I can't have it go there again. What, sh- what have I done successfully in the past? The things to celebrate. What was the difference? I can re-engineer that successful state, basically. Mm-hmm. Those circumstances. I can make that happen again. That's what I would be doing. Which is kind of a mental examination. Precisely. But then you know you'd go into that test and intensively review it, especially the things that you miss to make sure that there were opportunities to grow out of that and learn. Yeah. Even learning two days before the LSAT that, oh, you know what? I didn't really understand how that causality worked with those assumptions. I'm going to spend a little time on that. That's good. Yeah. It'll make you better. It's never too late to improve. I mean... More At some point, yeah. I mean, look, when, you, <laughs> <laughs> when you're dead, <laughs> when you're, you're not logging improving. in. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, this is all something that I think is just is useful. What successful people, period, not just LSAT test takers, what successful people seem to do is they process the feedback in a very precise and a very uniquely specific way. This is what I've found. Everything gets channeled through this lens of this is going to teach me something. Not this defines me, not this is who I am, not this, again, tells me what I'm going to be, but this is going to help me to do better. They remove the emotion from the analysis. Yeah. Because if the emotion is washing over you so heavily and you're feeling uh, suffocated by this test, overwhelmed by it, which is so normal. Exactly. Yeah. The, The fear of failure. These things are completely normal. And... It, it actually under, underlines a really important point. A lot of times when people go out and they've scored low on a practice test, they feel alone. They feel yeah. as if uh, everyone else is so successful and they feel like they're going to be judged by their friends. And as we've said elsewhere, that is not the case. And certainly in this instance, you are not alone for sure. This is one of the most common questions that we see. So if you're experiencing this, you need to know right now There's been tons and tons of people who have experienced this previously, but you have to take that, all that fear and anxiety that is swirling around in your head and you have to say, all right, I'm going to take a few minutes. I'm going to clear my senses as much as possible. And then I'm going to come back and I'm going to look at this and I'm going to look at it with a glass half full. I'm here to learn. I'm here to take something away from this and I'm going to get better at it. And then this is not going to happen again. Yeah. And that's, that's perfect. yeah, that's the cold, emotionless analysis that you have to, to make and to do. And it's not easy. I'm not saying that's simple. I'm just saying that's what is required and you're capable of it. Every single person listening to this is capable of doing that and like setting aside emotion from a test. This isn't your significant other. <laughs> this isn't something, you know, like that where you're like, there's so much emotion that is part of the relationship. This is the LSAT. You may hate this test. You may loathe it or even fear it, but you can say, if I went four and six on must be true questions, I can take a look at that and not think about the emotion of it and say to myself, why did I only get four right? Yeah, it's Precisely it. So I'm sitting here chuckling to myself for two reasons. One is we, it occurs to me how much we talk about this, and it's because people don't give us a choice. (laughs) This is just a constant conversational thread. And number two, it then occurs to me how we talk about this, that you can beat this test, and then you say this is not your significant other. And I'm like, (laughs) exactly. (laughs) (laughs) You can beat the test, but not your partner. (laughs) Aside from that. I, I never thought that that needed to be said, but apparently it does need to be said. I needed to say it. <laughs> I, like, I didn't expect to be talking about that. I think that's there pretty funny, go. though. Yeah, this is, let's call it learnable. This is the sort of thing where every piece of feedback that you get gives you an opportunity to improve yourself as a result. And that's exactly what you're talking about. But you have to divorce yourself from the emotion. Uh, and again, it's not necessarily the best way to live, but it is the best way to prepare for a test like this. And you say, you know, you can't avoid talking about it because it comes up so much. I actually love talking about it. I love the idea of the mentality of the test. I love the idea of even the mentality of being alive and <laughs> pursuing things with like a positive, passionate, confident nature because it's not just the LSAT that this affects. It affects everything. Yeah. I've know, got friends right now studying yeah. for the bar and this type of mentality is essential. 
from yeah, and the stakes law school, on the on you know. the bar are incredibly high for sure. We won't even talk about the complete mess that we're seeing in places like Florida with the Florida bar right now. But I wonder if that was going to come news. up. There we are. At some point, it had to just yeah. because it's such a cluster. <laughs> anyway, I think on that note, and just the idea of you know the the, the kind of like that low practice test coming in and mm-hmm. surprising you. Hopefully this puts you in a position that if this has happened, that you know what to do with it at this point, at least how to like mentally handle it. And if it hasn't, it might reassure you that, all right, if it did happen, I can just blow it off because that's what you should do. Just blow it off, learn from it, go forward. Yeah, it's perfect. All we could right, have, we could have left this whole thing to one sentence. <laughs> Why do we do this podcast when only one <laughs> sentence would have sufficed? <laughs> I know why we did this podcast. It's because people <laughs> demanded it. Um, it must be done. Why it went so long, I'll never know. All right. Well, on that note, if you get a chance, please subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, or anywhere else you may find it in the world. And if you've enjoyed it, please leave us a comment or give us a rating. If you have any questions, please send those to LSATpodcast at powerscore.com because I get the feeling we're going to do a mailbag relatively soon. And on that note, given the craziness surrounding me, I hope everyone else is completely safe and sound and happy. On behalf of John and myself, take care. Be safe. We'll talk to you soon. Mm